I know it's the first session after lunch, and everyone just had a nice meal, so let's get everybody invigorated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great. On behalf of the Air Force Association, welcome back to our Airspace and Cyber Conference, and we have a, have a really exciting panel for you today. Strengthening and sustaining force readiness is one of the top priorities of Air Force leadership. And it is imperative for the United States to maintain its air power dominance. This afternoon's panel, Air Force Rapid Capability Development, is one of the many professional development forums where we will speak about pressing matters prevalent to our Air Force. The rules of engagement for the session are as follows. Our speakers will make a short presentation, then take questions from the audience. Please write your questions on the cards that will be passed out by our volunteers. Moderate, moderating the question and answer portion of this session is Jack Blackhurst, Director of the Plans and Programs Directorate and Director of the Strategic Development Planning and Experimentation Directorate, Air Force Research Lab. Without further delay, I would like to introduce our speakers. General Stephen Wilson, Air Force Vice Chief of Staff. General Ellen Polakowski, Commander, Air Force Materiel Command. <laughs> Lieutenant General Arnie Bunch, Military Deputy, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition. <laughs> Lieutenant General J.D. Harris, Chief of Staff for Strategic Plans and Requirements. And finally, James Gertz, the Acquisition Executive at the U.S. Special Operations Command. Our speakers will now give their opening remarks. Well, let me start off with, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, people got to see uh, the Chief of Staff's discussion earlier today. And, and I can just tell you what an amazing chief we have. And to be able to work with the chief and secretary as we Take our Air Force here in the 21st century is uh, really cool. Um, can you imagine, though, General Goldfein, when he wakes up at night, what he thinks about? Let's see if I can get a slide to come up here. Here's what I think he's going to think about. Oh, no, that's not my slide. Go, go more, one more, please. Wilson! One more, there you go. <laughs> he's surrounded by both sides. Right. Well, he's, uh, what a, again, what a, blessing that we have is uh, to have as chief of right now in this really uh, chaotic world that we live in. One of the biggest challenges you heard the chief talk about is wait, what does the 21st century Air Force look like and what does it look like in 2030 and what's in our way? And what's in our way is, this, is the world is changing in unprecedented ways in a time and scale that, that uh, is really dramatic. And I talk about the Massive disruption going on politically, economically, socially, and technology-wise. And when you combine all four of those, it makes for exponential disruptive change. And with that, we've got to change how we acquire products. And our product development cycle, I think, is too long. Can I get the next slide, please? I went to a small state agricultural college, but this is my formula. All right, we have a two problem. In many cases, we're too slow, we're too expensive, we're too hard. We have too many stakeholders. You heard the secretary talk. We have way too much guidance, and we're too risk adverse. In the meantime, we also have uh, competitors around the globe that are changing and putting focus in areas like hypersonics, quantum computing, uh, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, robotics. And the gap that we once had, which was large, is now shrinking. In some areas, I'd even say we could be behind. So being too hard, too complex, and, and number two does not make a number one Air Force. So that's some of the things I think this panel is up here to talk about in areas that we can change. Can I get the next slide, please? But we have a way forward. I, I don't know if anybody knows the picture on the guy on the left, a very famous airman from our past. Maybe one of the most famous last names that, uh, in our American history that we don't think about. His name is Warren Avis. Right, he was an airman. He got out of the Air Force in 1946. He had this idea that I'm going to go sell cars at airports after flying for the United States Air Force. 
the big dog at the time was Hertz. If you remember his motto, it was Avis, we're number two, we try harder. And he did. He changed the face of how they sold, uh, how they rented cars, and he really put a lot of pressure on Hertz and caused Hertz to change because of that. So I think it's sometimes important to realize when you're number two and how you have to try harder. And when you're number one, what do you have to do to adjust to the changing world dynamics? The other picture I'll show you on the right side of that slide, if I were to ask for a raise of hands of who knows what that is, and I've asked thousands of people, I, I, very few people know what that is. It's a Chinese app, and it's called WeChat. And so you heard the chief talk about, do you share data? Good. Uh, and or data today in the 21st century is what oil was in the 19th century. But here's what China did. I think they, in many cases, out-innovated us in this app. Because that app made by Tencent is a, a, what I call a super app. So all the things that we do inside of our applications is done in one app. Uh, so f inside that app is the equivalent of Facebook and YouTube and Skype and Uber and Yelp and Waze. And on that, I can chat with people. I can uh, do my online banking. I can uh, order rides. Uh, it, it's uh, an all-in-one app that encompasses uh, many different things. Tell you to check it out. 1.2 billion users use that app today. 900 million in China, and yet most of America hasn't heard about it. And so, if I said uh, YouTube and Facebook and, and Yelp and all that data, what if I said air, land, sea, cyberspace, and all that data was shared inside one app? It'd be pretty remarkable. That's the way I think we have to think differently. In this case, somebody took what we were doing changed it and put together a pretty powerful capability that's taking all the data and sharing it across one platform. So I, I'm going to stop talking here, but I think there's a lot of room for how we can change the way we do business across, across this capability development. Because it's not just acquisition, it's requirements, it's acquisition, it's contracting, it's testing, but we've got to be able to take the, our current capability development process and take it from what I call 10 Moore's Law cycles and do it much, much faster. The good news is we got some fantastic people here that know how to do just that. I'm looking here at the uh, four captains that are sitting a few rows back. Chris Pence, Steve Lawyer, uh, Austin uh, De Lorraine, and Joey Atora are part of this tech accelerator group. Uh, go check out with them afterwards. They're working down in their, our AFWorks booth downstairs. They came and briefed me on an idea on a tech accelerator and what, they, what they're doing with a venture capital company uh, to be able to explore how we do counter UAS, uh, counter unmanned aerial system. How do we defeat that and how do we leverage that? And they've got an exciting opportunity. And so I look around this room and say the way we're going to fix it is the people sitting around the room. And I'm, I'm excited to be part of the team that's looking at that. And I know the rest of those folks here are going to talk through how we're going to get after this problem of capability development and do it faster. Next chart. Our next slide, I guess I should say. They told me to hold it up close. Okay, JD, over to you. All right, got it. Um, Thanks, everybody, for having us here. You've heard a lot about some of the, uh, well, at least one school up on the stage. So at this time, I'd like to make a quick shout out to all the ROTC teammates in the room. There is room. <laughs> OK, um, as you'll find out later, it's all an acquisition process that, that we struggle through at this point. And you know where the fault for that lies. But it, it is a process. And as we're going through uh, what we're trying to do on the requirements side of the house, we're trying to reduce the requirements. And it'll take multiple hacks. But our first attempt is try and cut that, that timeline in half. Uh, and then we'll probably swing it again and try and do that again uh, in another half. 
But the Capability Development Council is our lead for that. That's where we come together as often as we can or as often as we need to to make sure that when we meet we are looking at where we are appointed the Air Force uh, and then we'll come back to it later and determine what can we actually afford to get to. And that's part of what the Vice Chief was talking about. If we've got a lot of requirements that are out there. We don't have enough budget to fund all of those. So we're trying to make the best in the, uh, the priority of choices to get there. Sometimes at CDC, uh, to get after some either small things or some quick hitting items, we'll meet virtually, uh, and then we will continue to, uh, to make progress on the ECCTs that we have done in the past. But part of that, we just completed the Air Superiority 2030 ECCT. Uh, we had one person in charge. That person did an extremely great job coming out and produced, here's the plan, this is what we need to do. Uh, and then we've had a tough time to actually getting the resources to go out and make that happen. So I would expect you'll see some organizational changes coming up here in the near future in the 5-8 to make sure that we are getting after the design course process to, to make sure that rather than doing all the hard work and then trying to integrate what we do, we'll get the integration up front and then push it back for the hard work after that, that, that will surely follow from the MAGCOM. So you'll see some changes coming uh, real quick uh, in where we're headed for the Air Force. And then AFWorks, you've heard a little bit about that. That is our innovation storefront. And the first one will open up in Las Vegas, and that is not Nellis. It is actually downtown Las Vegas. That's important. That is where we go out and say, rather than try and close on a gap that we recognize is out there, what other things should we be aware of? We weren't thinking as a military about stealth. We were allowing others to come in and provide that to us. Uh, we'll probably have that same thing from a lot of our garage mechanics, our, our, our darkroom hackers, those types of things. So AFWorks will be our open door for that. Thank you. Next slide. Let's see if I can do this right this time. May not be voice activated by me. Okay, so General Wilson, thank, and for everybody out there, thanks for being here, and we look forward to your questions. The comments are going to be pretty short. We really want you to get some questions in so that we can try to answer them and we can address with what you want to hear about as we go forward. So uh, please take care of that. General Wilson, thanks for the lead-in and saying that it's not all acquisition. I appreciate your recognition of its requirements. It's all parts. It's also the financial piece. For General Harris, for your comment that it's all acquisition, as we say down south, God bless your little heart. Uh, if anybody's from the South, you know what that means. If you don't, you can talk to me later and I can give you a real definition of what it means. <laughs> uh, so uh, some of the efforts that we have ongoing in acquisition, and these are just a few, we really got a lot of initiatives going forward to try to speed the process up. Some of those to speed smaller acquisitions are delegating down and pushing down authorities. You heard the Secretary-in-Chief talk about that relative to squadrons. We're doing that in the acquisition community of pushing decision-making authority down below the program executive officers that's really been embraced today 68 percent of the programs that we can delegate below the peos have uh, been delegated to include all of those that are acat3 programs over in the space portfolio so we're really trying to do that we're looking at where we can uh, raise limits so that we can move money or make decisions in a manner without having to go say mother may i in a lot of different ways we're addressing that with osd and with everybody else uh, we are pushing modular open and uh, trying to make that reality. We've taken that now down into subcomponents. So right now, one of the ones that is uh, on everybody, alternative PNT, position navigation and timing is a big issue. Uh, one of the things we're actually doing is establishing an open standard that's going to go in a uh, resilient enhanced GPS INS so that we can insert software later to address problems that may come up to have assured position, navigation, and timing, which is critical to what we do to put weapons on target, run all of our systems, and make sure our communications work properly and get everything synced up. So we have a lot of efforts going into the modular and open. We're putting it in our big acquisition programs, which many of you have heard about, but we're also putting it in a lot of other areas that we are uh, trying to do across the enterprise. Uh, we, one of the things that we continue to talk about, and General Wilson talked about, you got to get, uh, you got to be willing to take more risk. One of the things we're pushing is we need to get agreement on how much risk you're willing to take. You know, if you want something that's a 99.9% .9 probability of working, that's a different uh, solution set than if you're willing to take a 90%. And we just need to be informed and have the dialogue with all parties so that we understand what we're doing so that we can go faster where we really need to and maybe build off that in an incremental approach where we do the requirements in increments as well. Uh, the other one we have to do, we need to all, use all of our authorities that we have available 
and we need to be able to use all of those new ones that Congress has pushed us to streamline our acquisition efforts. Congress has been really supportive. They've given us a lot of legislation to get us uh, some rapid prototyping, rapid fielding, experimentation. They've given us a lot of different ways and trials we can do. They've been very supportive, and we're working with them to communicate what we need to be able to do, uh, what other impediments we run into so that we can try to move even faster. And we also have to look at agile business practices. Uh, what, what I mean by that is if you've managed one program, you've managed one program. Every program that we do is different. And what works on uh, ground-based strategic deterrent may not be what works on a new radar for a platform. Or it may not be what works for a business system or an agile software development. And what we have to do is utilize all the contracting authorities and the business practices we have and, and to make that work. And then the last one, which is really, really important. This is a team sport. If we're going to do this right, we've got to have a great dialogue with uh, the requirements folks so that we understand what they really need and they understand the ramifications of what they're telling me they need. And then the other one we have to do is we really have to have a transparent dialogue with industry because industry in a lot of ways is on the uh, knows much more about where technology is and what's not made out of unobtainium. Uh, so that we can make sure that we're developing programs that are executable and we need to work together to make sure we do that in an expeditious manner to get at what we need to do for the warfighter. And with that, I'll pass it over to General Paul Kowski. Okay, let's see if we can get the next. Oh, look at that. See, look at that. It was instantaneous. How do you like that? Okay, so uh, unlike um, my, my, my fellow airmen up here from the Pentagon who can point at each other and try to blame who is it is that's slowing down or not making capability development happen. In Air Force Materiel Command, the buck stops here. Capability development has been a core mission of AFMC from its beginnings, even before AFMC was AFMC. So when we talk about developing capabilities for the Air Force that the Air Force has today and will have in the future, there isn't anywhere else in the Air Force that it happens besides AFMC. The technologies that are explored that are going to lead to the next capability come from the Air Force Research Lab. The Life Cycle Management Center and the Nuke Weapon Center are the nexus of how we actually work with you in the industry to deliver those capabilities. The Sustainment Center, part of the de capability development is ensuring that we can actually keep these airplanes, these systems flying and working and, and work every time an airman is counting on it being there. And the test center is our conscience that those dreams we had for capability aren't reality unless they actually work the way we thought that we designed them and that's what the test center does for us. And then the installation and mission support center ensures that we have what we need on the installations and we have the support contracts and we have everything else we need to do it. So it's a package deal for AFMC. All, all six of our centers have to be part of this team. And, but what is different today than back in uh, 30 years ago when AFMC was first stood up? And I think you heard snippets of it first from General Wilson and then General Harris and then General, General Bunch. There's been a number of significant things that have changed and I think for the better when it comes to enabling AFMC to be more effective as long as we are able to leverage these tools. General Harris talked about the Capability Development Council and the Enterprise Capability Collaborations teams. Those were, when we stood those up, I think arguably for the first time maybe ever in the Air Force, we started to look at capabilities from a full enterprise perspective. We looked at it not as something in space, so we, well, you know, a group over there worries about that piece or something on the ground, something in mobility or something in uh, air combat. When we stood up the the Strategic Development Planning and Experimentation Office and the Capability Development Council, we embrace capability as an enterprise capability, not as platforms that were kind of kludged together. And that was significant in enabling Air Force Materiel Command 
to be able to tackle things from an enterprise perspective because we had that function in there. The second thing that happened was what General Bunch talked about with respect to opportunities for new ways of doing business. And that includes some of the additional uh, authorities that were given to General Goldfein and the other chiefs that have enabled us to do the things like the experimentation we had. We have uh, new contracting authorities or uh, revisions and rejuvenation of contracting authorities that we've tried to, that we have leveraged. And also the introduction, introduction of technologies that have allowed us to do things more rapidly. Um, we are, the ability of embracing those vendors, shall we say, that are not normally the ones that we deal with, which is what the, the great team of our tech accelerators has been able to do. To, last year, I think it was, somebody asked me why there weren't any entrepreneurs on the floor. And I said, well, you wouldn't find an entrepreneur at the op or a millennial at the opera, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you got four entrepreneurs sitting right there, and they're working with an entrepreneurial firm uh, that is helping them to, a, 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 an entrepreneurial broker, I call it, I know they don't like it when I say that, that's reaching out to other entrepreneurs. So that's where you're going to find the entrepreneurs, is by what they're doing. And so what AF, Air Force Materiel is doing right now is we're providing the people, the energy, the nexus to make those things happen so that we can leverage all of those things, the things you see on there that enable us to get things to the field faster. Example recently was the light attack experiment that you heard the chief talk about. We conducted that from the beginning to the end, getting the, getting the, the airplanes there in less than six months. That would have taken us two and a half, three years to do uh, using, with, if we hadn't leveraged uh, the things that we talked about here, to include the Capability Development Council, to include these, to include the encouragement from our chief and the vision that he has. So for me, the whole transition we have done in the last two years um, is encouraging to see that we do have the tools in place as long as we empower our airmen to be able to use them. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, those who don't know me, I'm Hanno Gertz. I'm the Acquisition Executive down at U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak with all of you guys. And again, perhaps uh, use SOCOM as uh, one of the many places to pilot new things, uh, see uh, what we've been working on and what uh, can be scaled up to work at the Air Force level and then uh, what uh, doesn't scale up so well. And so the, the first thing I would say is um, don't rely on the people on this stage to give you permission to go make changes, take initiative, be persistent, go get it done. If you're waiting for us, we are going to fail. Okay? There's things we can do for you. We can help remove barriers. Uh, but it's really on you to take the initiative. And, and the biggest thing down at Special Operations Command, where, again, I see where the Air Force is also moving, it's a culture, it's a mindset, and it's really leveraging uh, our great people. Uh, and so there's an incredible amount of talent sitting out here. Uh, I've seen more chiefs here than I think I've seen uh, in forever, and I've seen more CGOs than I've seen in forever. And, and so the ability for you guys to leverage both that experience, the no kidding one has to happen uh, on the flight line or back in the shop, as well as new ideas, is really where, uh, where you guys are going to be able to take this to the next level. That's uh, kind of by the nature of our culture inside at SOCOM where, where we get some advantage. Uh, because for us, velocity is our competitive advantage. Uh, and so everything we're doing looks at velocity, right? Velocity is speed in the right direction. If you can go fast over the cliff, that doesn't do you much good either, right? So you got to know where you're going and then uh, get out and go after it. Uh, and then have a mindset uh, that you're going to be pioneers. You're breaking barriers. You're, you're doing the things the Air Force is known for. Uh, if you can leverage that mindset, you can make uh, great strides. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, things, you know, the thing that keeps me up at night is a great idea sitting out in the audience that could help me get a mission done, help me get something to the operators uh, that doesn't get to somebody who can act on it. Okay, so there's kind of two parts of the equation. One part of the equation is get the ideas, uh, and so SoftWorks and a lot of things we're doing to reduce barriers to get ideas to us uh, is really important. 
but the harder half of that problem is then actually get it in the field. And so don't just think about it as a buying problem, right? Because a capability is equipment, it's tactics, and it's training. And you can have all the best equipment in the world, but if you don't have folks trained and if you don't have the right tactics, you can't really exploit it. And so the, you know, the key for us is closing that distance between operator, uh, technical people, and acquisition folks. And the uh, more we scrunch that down, acting in an operationally oriented culture is really where you can get some great acceleration. Uh, I love to see the things going on with decentralizing and pushing decision levels down and all that, that's great. Uh, but you guys got to be willing to step up, all right, uh, and be accountable and take risks. Uh, and, and again, I think you're hearing the leadership in the Air Force uh, signaling that's the intent. Um, and again, hopefully uh, everybody will step up to that. And then the, the last piece I would just say is um, yeah, we've got a lot of great single instrument players out there uh, and, and talking in acquisition terms or even as industry. We know how to do a FAR Part 15 contract really well. And if you go to SOCOM, we can do that really well. But there's a lot of new instruments out there. And so what I look for in our best leaders, uh, especially for you uh, young folks out there, I look for three things. I look for curiosity. Are you looking at all the different tools? Are you asking questions? Are you coming to SOCOM seeing what we're doing? Are you seeing what your buddy's doing somewhere on a different program? Are you taking initiative? Are you willing to go try? And that might mean failing, and that might mean you don't get the best performance report what you tried. And then are you persistent? Are you gonna work through the first contact with the bureaucracy that tries to hold you down? Uh, again, we need to do it on the government side. Industry and the audience, I would say the same thing. You become a mirror of us, uh, and so if you aren't willing to change in the same way, we're gonna get stuck kind of with the same results. So I think there's great opportunity. It's absolutely imperative we go after it. Uh, business as usual is not going to get us here. A lot of great tools out there. Um, we've got to figure out, one, as leadership, how to enable you, and then two, as a folks in the field, whether in industry, on the flight line, uh, or in, uh, in a program office, step up and uh, seize those opportunities. Thanks for the opportunity to comment and join the crowd here. Okay, very good. Uh, now it's an opportunity. Uh, while they've been speaking, you've been writing me questions. And so I will get it. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, and so I will try and get through as many of the questions uh, that you have. So uh, for the vice, uh, the first question is, earlier this week, the secretary announced a new s and study. How is this fitting into capability development? Yeah, so the secretary has asked us to look across all of S&T to prioritize what's important, to be able to look at both basic and applied research so that we can prioritize those areas that we need to focus on. Where do we have a competitive advantage? Where are we at a disadvantage? Where would, we, where would we spend our next dollar? And then how do we partner again with all the different universities and, and uh, uh, centers across the country where this expertise is? So uh, I, I think our s and community is, is, hey, they're working really hard. They're really fantastic. If you go talk to General Cooley and his AFRL team, they are unbelievably talented. Now we're going to just need to be able to focus that research and prioritize that research. And again, as, as, as Mr. Gertz talked about the, at the end, this velocity becomes a competitive advantage. We have to be able to, to, be able to move, move fast, focused in the right areas, and keep our competitive advantage. So I, I think... Uh, we're, we're really looking forward to this study coming up. I know there's a lot of people that will help in it, uh, but I think it will help shape the direction we head uh, through our 2030 uh, development time frame. Okay, for General Harris, what is the Air Force doing to expand this capability development model to include sister services, coalition partners, or other government agencies? Well, that's a great question. The, uh, the Capability Development Council already includes our joint partners, so you see that participation already from, from our Navy and our, our Army land teammates. But we are recently now expanding it also to Five Eyes, so trying to take it out of the secret no foreign environment, bring it out to where it's much more releasable, uh, and we'll see some of the original partners, uh, Canada, Australia, UK, uh, moving right into the effort and, and already volunteered participating and providing information on what it is they're doing at their country. So we'll see that collaboration pick up even more here in the near future. Thank you. Uh, General Palakowski. How do you convince the military-industrial complex to buy into the vision of interconnected systems when protection of proprietary data and architecture feeds their profit profitability and survival? Well, I 
I know a number of ways to convince the industrial base of anything, but one way I do it is when I put out a, re a request for, him for a proposal, and we essentially re articulate that we value what the chief talked about, right? I mean, he said there's the first question. Can it connect? Good. Can it communicate? Even better. And I think the bottom line for us, as you heard it from the top just earlier today, that our, uh, we, when we see the future of warfare in 2030 and beyond, that Chief 24, that we are, our focus is going to shift from not looking at individual platforms, but the network. And as the Chief says, the apps and the apertures. And the way you're going to be able to be competitive and be able to be part of that network of apps and apertures is to be able to answer those two questions. And the way to answer those two questions is to not to give me something that doesn't connect because it's a proprietary solution. And, and I, by the way, um, we've done some things that I think that have, that have worked collaboratively with the industry to make this happen. The open mission systems, for example, which was led by the RCO and now has transitioned to the Lifecycle Management Center, was not done by the government developing the standards and then putting it into a spec. That was done with a collaboration of the industry to develop that, and we're continuing that model. And in fact, we're expanding that model into other, other areas. So I think. The first thing we do is we make sure you, everyone understands that it's going to be all about the network because, as General Wilson said, it's all about the data and the speed at which we can get that information in an actionable form. The second thing is we're not going to go at this kind of like we did in the past where we did things like, anybody remember ADA? That was a real success, wasn't it? Um, we're going to do this collaboratively with you with the uh, industry, uh, industry community to find something that is an optimum for all of us. But in Alan Polakowski's opinion, the day of proprietary stovepipe architectures is over for the Air Force because they don't connect and they don't communicate. Thank you. Mr. Gertz, how does USOS uh, uh, SOCOM define success with their model? And is there an example you could provide? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, success is uh, proven on the battlefield. Uh, and so, you know, everything we do has that bent to it. Um, but you've got to be very careful that you don't measure everything you do by does it affect the battlefield tonight, or you can have a, you know, six-day problem for the next 20 years. So our, our, our approach is really to think about uh, innovation and new methods in, in a couple of probably three different dimensions. One is, can it help me tonight? Can I do what I have to do every day better and better and better? Uh, second dimension is what I would call discovery. Is somebody doing something? Is there a product out there? Is there a tool out there I can immediately adapt uh, and either create a new effect or uh, be able to execute a mission better uh, with that? And then the third is what's kind of new to the world uh, and where are you going to create capability which does not exist? Uh, and so the way you attack each of those is a little bit different. Um, a lot of what we're doing with SoftWorks, partnering with the Air Force on Air Force Works is, is really working on all three of those dimensions. Are there tools out there today that can help what we're doing today better and better? If so, buy them, right? Are there things that we can put together in new and different ways uh, to create a new capability or take care of an, an existing gap in, in a new and interesting way? Uh, so it's more discovery. And then what's kind of the pure invention piece of it? Um, because if we don't start um, challenging our basic assumptions, we're always going to be reacting. And so capability gaps tend to be a reaction. So you're trying to close a gap. I want to create gaps against my competitors. I want to open up gaps and get them to chase me. And so you've got to be able to also not just think about current problems, but creating opportunities as you go forward. And so we, again, use a, a multitude of uh, really interesting tools to get at that. And that third dimension of kind of new to the world tends not to be as expensive uh, in dollars. It tends to be intellectually expensive. 
And so that means you've got to really uh, exploit diversity. You know, if there's a problem we have in the Air Force, I bet if we got everybody in this room engaged, we could come up with a better way to solve it. Um, but right now, you get stuck in whatever squadron silo you're in or whatever program office silo you're in, and if, heaven forbid you have an idea to help the fighter mafia if you're in the bomber mafia, right? And so part of what we're really trying to do in SOCOM is how do we break that kind of uh, cycle so that you know, what we find is our most creative ideas are almost directly proportional to the, the amount of diversity of backgrounds and opinions and experiences uh, looking at problems. If you just get the same people looking at it, you tend to get the same answers. So, I, you know, again, how I measure innovation in each three of those dimensions uh, is fundamentally different, uh, but all important. Thank you. General Bunch, one of the biggest challenges to going fast seems to be the need to align acquisition, finance, contracting, and requirements. What are we doing to align all of these stakeholders to go fast? So uh, I think I gave a speech the other day. I said I think the first step is to admit that you've got a problem. So you know, we have admitted that we have a problem. Uh, we are talking about one of the examples I will use right now. We're trying a Pathfinder program, and I think uh, I'll use that as an example of where I think we will have to eventually go. It's an uh, air operations center. We're doing a Pathfinder to do agile developmental ops of the software. And we're taking a small uh, bite at the overall apple of what requirements we need. And we're trying to align the contracting strategy, the way we do the testing, the way we do the development, how we work with a warfighter. And we're trying to synchronize all those together to go a different way. And in this one, there, I will say now there is 0% chance we'll get it 100% right. Um, but what we hope to uncover as we do this and discover as we do this is where are the roadblocks? Where are the impediments? Where do we need to get more help? How do, for example, if I want to do a test and I want to put it out and I need to do it all automated, I have to design all that testing in up front and create the right infrastructure so that I can do it and I get all the community to buy in before I can go down that path. That's not historically how we have done our acquisition programs. We've done development, and then we've tested, and then we've put out in the field. We've done it in serial. This is an attempt to see how we can merge those together and uh, try to make that work. I believe we're going to need more flexibility with how we use dollars and more flexibility to move dollars around with where the requirements are. I think we're going to need uh, help with the requirements, and J.D. and I have talked about this. How do we make the requirements a, a container that we operate within so that we can do incremental and push things out to get more capability to the field quicker. We're going to have to look at our contracting methodologies and how we do it. Uh, and we're looking at some of those. We may need to do time and materials for some development activity, which we've not historically done. Or we may need to, do, we need to use all kinds of different methodologies, and we've got to think through all these because each situation is going to be different. But we are trying to attack those. And the fact that we're talking about it's the whole spectrum of things is a big step instead of just pointing at one part of the community because we've all got to work together. We really want to solve this. And much of it is beyond the Air Force and the Department of Defense. If I could, I just want to add a little bit on to this because um, General Bunch has hit on some really key things, but there's more to this. There's some cultural change we have to do. Um, I, when I look at, when we talk about agile software development, and you talked about the AOC 10.2 and what we were doing there, you know, we, we have become very structured in, in our processes across the board that are focused on what's good for hardware. And so we have, as I, as I like to say, we're very enamored with our systems engineering V. And by golly, we are going to be disciplined and go through that systems engineering process and devolve requirements down and then de design little pieces and test it. I put it to you, we have to start thinking about this a little differently. If you look at the requirements, instead of taking them at the top and involving them down to little details and then working our way back up to the to the big requirements, which is what our traditional hardware process does, we have to look at it slicing it the other way so that we can get something delivered quickly. It may not do everything that we do, but then we put it in the hands of the warfighter. That's like Mr. Gertz said. And we may find that 40% of what we were going to do actually isn't what we really 
we need or want anymore because we got something into the hands of the operator quickly. So we have to, we have to change the way we think in every single discipline in our business, whether it's engineering, contracting, financial management, and then we can start to tackle what are some of the challenges with respect to laws and regulations. But I'm convinced that a lot of what we, that a majority of what we can do, we can do without changes to the law if we just rethink and, and get ourselves out of that structure that has become, that is so focused on hardware and think about this in a different way. Could I, uh, I'm going to pile on to that great comment by uh, General Pajkowski about uh, culture. One of the things that we're also going to start doing is making sure we drive outcomes. So let's take a look. A couple weeks ago, uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon put out an uh, outcome to Amazon that said, we're going to do same-day delivery. Okay. Here's what I think happened inside Amazon. I bet 2,000 people coughed up a hairball. <laughs> what? Sa same-day delivery? That's, we can't do that. And yet, they will now find a way to remove the processes that stifle that from happening. They'll learn to take risk in the following areas to drive that outcome. We're going to do that same thing. We're going to start driving outcomes across the capabilities that we need. Right? And, and to do that, we haven't talked much today, but there's a whole piece to this about the human capital piece, the development of our people that understand, as General Bunch talked about, where we can take the risk, as General Pajkowski talked about, developing this empowered culture of people that can drive outcomes. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so, uh, uh, the Vice. Uh, many of these initiatives like ActWorks, ECCTs, and experiments will require long-term funding to make a difference. In the current fiscal environment, how are we making sure there will be money left behind for these initiatives? Jack, if I heard the questions, all, all those do take money, but we're going to, again, as we drive outcomes, as we look at uh, uh, another model that says we're going to plant a bunch of seedlings, we're going to experiment broadly, prototype, double down where it makes sense, and then be able to drive success on those areas that are, that are flourishing. Uh, we, we know that some of them aren't going to be successful, right? but we, what we can't do is we cannot continue the current path the way we do business. The world is changing too fast. This, uh, this Mr. Gertz will tell in uh, different forms. We've got this globally accessible technology, the results and capabilities that, that uh, often has malicious intent and our adversaries are, are maneuvering faster. We have got to become faster. We've got to become more agile. And so we're going to experiment broadly. And so whether it be DIUX or with AFWorks, uh, with, with a bunch of different prototyping experimentation, to see what works and then being able to double down in those areas and see if we can uh, jump ahead. Thank you very much. Bill Spencer, you want to close this out? Hey, hey, Vice, if I can just pile on it, kind of the SOCOM approach to that, um, where I think you guys are heading and we're in similar directions, right? One's kind of vision of future, so back to prioritizing what's important, where do we need to create either capability uh, overmatch or deal with it. Right? You've got to create modular and scalable platforms, as Jerome Palakowski said, so that if you don't have it perfectly right, your opportunity risk to change it to get it right is not start over and spend a couple of years. And then you've got to relentlessly and boldly experiment. And again, for everybody in the room, especially those non-acquisition folks, that doesn't mean lab guys only. That means experiment on the flight line. It means experiment in tactics. It means experimenting you know, back uh, across the whole Air Force. And then finally, you've got to create an acquisition system, combination requirements, funding, contracting, that can capture those opportunities. I, th I think, uh, you know, you do those four things, you get back up on step, and, and, uh, and that's at least the way we're approaching it, and it sounds like we're, we're well aligned. Okay, thank you all very much for our speakers for a very uh, timely and informative discussion. Also, want to thank you all for being here and participating. I think if this was, uh, I got a lot out of, out of this discussion. I hope you did as well. Um, for full coverage of this year's conference, uh, can be found at AFA's Daily Report. 
please go to airforcemag.com to catch up on all the latest Air Force news. We will now take a short break. Please return to your seats by 2.05 p.m. and refer to your programs for the next speaker session. Thank you very much. Thank you.